everyone and welcome. For those of you joining us for the first time, I'm Maggie Mahan, the Assistant Director for Community Engagement with the State Historical Society of Missouri. Thanks so much for joining us for Out of the Stacks, utilizing the State Historical Society of Missouri's LGBTQIA collections. Starting in 1980 with the accession of Mid-Continent Life Services Corporation records, Ann Kinney, the former St. Louis Associate Director, spearheaded the St. Louis Research Center's efforts to collect LGBTQIA history. Building on that work for over 40 years, SHSMO has continued to add collections from around the state. On the panel today, we have Stephen Brawley, founder of the St. Louis LGBT History Project, Carrie Yost and Steph Borkland, Associate Professors of Digital Filmmaking at Stevens College, and SHSMO archivist Heather Richmond. Following an overview of the collections, Yost and Borkland will discuss their research in SHSMO's Helen Stevens collection for their forthcoming film, Chronicling Stevens' Life. Today's event, like all events in our virtual programming series, is made possible thanks to the generous support of the state Historical Society of Missouri's members and donors. You can visit our website at shsmo.org to learn more and see how you can add or renew your support. Thank you again for joining us. And now I will turn things over to Stephen Brawley to start the conversation. Thank you, Maggie. Um, appreciate being here and appreciate all those who are joining us um, for today's presentation. Um, I'm honored to also um, be a trustee of the society. I'm one of the newest trustees joining last fall. So I send greetings from the board of trustees um, for this um, important um, presentation today. Um, I made a commitment by joining the board to work towards ensuring that we would be able to find innovative ways to um, diversify um, the um, efforts of the society. And I'm very well aware of the vibrant collection that the society has. Um, I'm an UMSL grad and as founder of the St. Louis LGBT History Project. I have been working with the St. Louis office for many, many years and I've donated many, many items to the collection. So I'm very, very well aware of the collection, but it wasn't until the last few years that I really saw the depth of the collection that's across the state. So um, just going on the website and, and looking at the archives and seeing what's in there, um, it's amazing. Um, so Missouri is blessed to have such a vibrant um, LGBTQIA historical group. Um, we have the, um, in addition to the State Historical Society's work, um, there's work done in St. Louis at the Missouri History Museum, and we have three independent LGBTQIA history projects across Missouri, in Kansas City, in Springfield, and in St. Louis. So when you look at the collectivity, and plus many others, but if you look at the collectivity of efforts being made to preserve and promote our um, very diverse, um, vibrant LGBTQIA past, Missouri has a lot going on and I'm very proud of it. And when I talk to colleagues across the nation, they're very impressed and somewhat surprised that Missouri having somewhat of a conservative reputation would have such a vibrant archival effort. So just wanna say one of the reasons I wanted to do this presentation was to really uh, make sure that people A, understood what the society was doing, but that um, it's pretty, um, pretty progressive and, and a lot going on. So I'm just, I'm happy to, to be here, to be part of this conversation. Um, Heather's going to in a minute get into the details of learning about it. Um, and then Steph and Carrie are gonna talk about their amazing, how they use the um, um, society for the research that they're conducting on Helen Stevens. So um, feel free, make sure you're um, asking questions. We can have a vibrant discussion as the, as the day goes. Um, but again, just wanna um, send my greetings and I'm gonna be sitting back um, like a sponge and absorbing the information with the rest of you. So um, Heather, um, why don't you take it away and let's learn about um, out of the stacks at the society. Thanks, Heather. Thanks, Stephen. Um, so I am gonna go ahead and share my screen. Uh, so I'm gonna be talking a little bit today um, just about how to find LGBTQIA materials um, at the State Historical Society of Missouri. I'm Heather Richman. Um, as Stephen mentioned, I'm um, an archivist here at the State Historical Society. 
Um, and as Stephen mentioned, we have a lot of materials in St. Louis specifically. Um, we did start collecting there in 1980. We have a lot of materials documenting individuals and organizations um, based out of St. Louis, um, going back really to the to the 70s um, and documenting um, the whole late 20th century and early 21st century. But we do have six research centers across the state um, in Kansas City, Columbia, St. Louis, Springfield, Rolla, and Cape. And I wanna mention that materials can be uh, transferred between all of these research centers. So if there's a St. Louis collection that you find on our website that you're interested in, but you're in say Columbia or Springfield, you can have that material transferred to our research center there um, for viewing. So what types of materials do we have? Um, well, we have several different types of materials here. We have publications like books, magazines, newspapers. We have photographs, um, documents, AV materials. Um, I'll just mention this is this photograph here um, on this slide is from the Mary Jane Barnett papers, um, which the photographs from that collection have actually been digitized. And I'll show you later how to access that. Um, Mary Jane and her partner, Tommy Davis, Davis uh, ran a drugstore together in Cape Girardeau in the mid 20th century. And this is an amazing collection that we have that documents their uh, social and private lives. Uh, so a lot of our materials documenting LGBTQIA life in Missouri um, are brought together in our LGBTQ research guide that you can find on our website. I'm just gonna show you really quickly how to access that. Um, so from our homepage, um, there's a research drop-down menu and uh, it, it just, you can click on research guides, the research guides link from there. Uh, you'll get to a page with a lot of links on it. About halfway down is the LGBTQ experience research guide. Um, and the guide starts with a really brief history of the LGBTQIA experience in Missouri. And then um, if you scroll down, you're gonna have um, little headings that you can pop open and link to different parts of the, of the website. Um, so I'm going to start by the catalog. Um, so if you open the catalog uh, uh, heading and pop that open, hit view the online catalog, you can see materials that we have that are cataloged in Merlin, the University of Missouri's um, online catalog. That is what we use to catalog our publications. But I want to mention, and you can see if you do a search for the term gay, for example, um, the first thing that comes up is actually Stephen's book um, that we have in our collections. Um, and below that, you'll see uh, there's a dissertation. Um, so we have materials. Yeah, sorry, it's uh, like probably pretty small on there. Um, so you'll have, so we have materials. Um, that are histories of gay life in Missouri and also coming out of um, the community. So uh, a little further down, the Gay News Telegraph from the 1980s. But then, um, because we searched on the word gay, you're going to get some false hits, right? We are a historical organization, so the old use of the term gay is going to come up. You know, we've got um, a musical score for 1949 for a song called Happy and Gay. You know, so you're going to get some false hits there. Um, oh, and one other thing I wanted to mention um, with uh, the publications, they are not all in Merlin. So you're going to be finding LGBTQIA publications that came out of the community. Some of those are going to be in Merlin, like the Gay News Telegraph, but then some are going to be um, in manuscript collections, especially St. Louis has a couple of uh, manuscript collections that have a lot of LGBTQIA publications in them. So if you're looking for a publication, you're gonna be looking in both places. You're gonna be looking in Merlin and you're gonna be looking in the manuscript collections. Um, I wanted to make that clear. One, um, one resource we have that is actually not linked out of um, the research guide is mainstream newspapers. 
Um, and you can find um, information about LGBTQIA life in Missouri in mainstream newspapers. Uh, we have newspapers going back all the way to 1808 from all over the state on microfilm. And we have a robust newspaper digitization program. Um, so a, a lot, not all obviously, but a lot of our newspapers have been digitized and they're available on newspapers.com. Um, you have to get to them via the SHSMO website um, in order for that to be free, but it is freely available on newspapers.com um, if you go through our website. Uh, a lot of our newspapers that are digitized are older um, because of copyright issues, but we do have more some modern newspapers digitized, um, such as this example of the, um, the Macon, this Macon newspaper. So I'm just going to show you really quickly how to find the um, article on here. So if you go again to our research drop down menu, there's a collections drop down and you can go to newspapers. Um, the Missouri Digital Newspaper Project is where you get to our um, uh, newspaper collection, our digital newspaper collections. You expand that and you click view digital newspapers. And then you're going to get to a list um, that is alphabetical by county um, and it has links to all of our digitized newspapers. So from that list, you can click on the paper and it's gonna show the dates um, that are included that are digital. And you click on the county or you click on the newspaper title um, and you can do a search here um, in newspapers.com and you can tell it's free because it has our um, logo on it. Um, if you end up on a part of newspapers.com that does not have our logo on it, it will no longer be free and it will ask you to pay for a subscription. Um, but if you make sure you're in the part with our logo, <laughs> um, you're, you're going to be good. Um, this is really important because it's easy to kind of accidentally wander out of there. Um, and you can search across our newspapers here. I've done a search within the Making Chronicle Herald, but you can search across our newspapers um, within the free part of the website. So here I searched um, the term homosexual. Of course, you are, if you're doing searches, um, in older newspapers, you're going to be using terminology from the times, right? You're searching in the primary sources. So terms like sodomy, homosexual, you know, and, and honestly, back in the early and mid 20th century, the mainstream newspapers were gonna be reporting on scandals and criminal charges. Um, and that's, that's where you're gonna be, you know, what you're gonna be finding. So here um, I did a search for homosexual and the third, um, the third result got me to uh, this article about uh, the famous incident where an MU professor was fired for being gay. Um, and there are quite a few um, newspaper articles um, about this event. This was um, pretty famous. It's actually been written about quite a bit in recent years. So I mentioned photographs um, and the Mary Jane Barnett photo collection that is online. Um, this is a photo of her partner, Tommy. Um, and you can just link to the photo collection. The easiest way to access it is to just link it from the LGBTQ um, research guide. Um, there are other ways to access it, but it, this is really just the fastest is you just, just to go to the link. Um, and there are over 200 uh, photos from their lives online. It's really amazing. It's a fun collection to just kind of browse through. Um, so the meat of our LGBTQIA collections is really the manuscript collections. Um, and the Mary Jane Barnett photos, those come out of a manuscript collection. Um, as I mentioned, uh, we have um, publications um, are in our manuscript collections. We have quite a few LGBTQIA publications in manuscript collections. Um, just briefly, um, when I say manuscript collections, otherwise known as archives, these are unpublished, usually materials that have been donated to us by individuals, families, organizations. Stephen has been a donor. <laughs> um, and manuscript materials were created in the course of everyday life. So this is just stuff that people generated in their lives, the snapshots they took.
with letters they wrote each other, diaries, meeting minutes of organizations, um, ephemera, you know, like concert tickets, um, and including AV materials. Um, and modern manuscript collections can also be digital, right? Because we're creating more and more of our lives um, digitally. Uh, so to get to the manuscripts, again, we have a handy link on the uh, research guide, and that's really the fastest way to get to it. Um, that'll take you to an alphabetical list uh, of our uh, collections with brief descriptions of each collection. You can kind of get a feel for, you know, what you're looking at there. But if you're, um, if you're not sure if a collection is relevant to your research, you can click on the link that says finding aid. Um, the finding aids are uh, longer descriptions of the contents of a collection. Um, they usually include uh, information about the size of the collection. They have a history of the person who created the collection or the organization who created the collection. In this case, that's, uh, these are the promo records that we have in St. Louis. Um, and then there's a narrative description of the contents of the collection and folder a list of folder titles. And often we also have our collections indexed. So if you're looking for specific names, sometimes you can find those in the indexes. Um, and notice, so the promo records are under collection size, it says 12 cubic feet. So that's like 12 big boxes. So. And that's actually not that big of a collection for an archives, believe it or not. Like that's maybe like medium or even considered small. So um, that is why these finding aids are so important. You really, you need them to navigate the collections. You can't just say, hey, pull it all out and I'll take a look at it when I come in. You gotta figure out, you know, okay, what is relevant to my research in here? And then, you know, from there you're gonna be, um, uh, getting in touch with us to come in and take a look at it. I want to mention, you know, the, the Mary Jane Barnett papers are digitized and, and we've been digitizing newspapers, but a, unfortunately a lot of our LGBTQIA collections cannot be digitized because they are so modern and there are copyright restrictions um, on, you know, materials that are, you know, past a certain date. So it's just, you know, the, the reality is that you know these late 20th century collections have to be accessed in person um, for the most part. Um, oh, and I also wanted to mention you can always search our website. Um, so that um, the site, um, just the regular site search searches all of our finding aids because um, they're PDFs on the website. So you know if you're just looking for you know whatever you don't want to browse through, or you have something very specific, you have a name you're looking for, um, you can always do the site search and um, it'll, you know, uh, bring up some results. Um, so as far as accessing materials, I mentioned before that materials can be transferred uh, between all of our branches. Microfilm, microfilm like uh, the, uh, like the newspaper microfilm can be sent to other libraries via interlibrary loan. That is the one thing that circulates, you know, to other libraries outside of our, um, the State Historical Society of Missouri. Um, to come and look at materials, um, you can make an appointment. These are our hours. Um, and we have a, a research request form um, that you can fill out. You can also just call us um, to make an appointment to come view materials. And we do, you know, the main reason we ask people to make appointments is because some of our um, uh, manuscript materials are stored offsite, you know, or for example, if you wanted to view something from another research center, it could take a week or two to get it here. Um, so we just, we want to make sure that your stuff is here when you come to look at it. Um, so making an appointment is advantageous for you. Um, so in order to, uh, one way to make an appointment is to fill out the research request form, which again, that research drop down, um, you go to research request. And if you want to make an appointment, you click yes, and you'll have all the boxes to fill out. If you click no, um, the form changes slightly and you can just, if you have an inquiry about anything, um, we do a little bit of remote research here for people for a fee. So if you can't make it in to look at something, but you've got you know, a quick research request, um, you can get that process started 
by filling out this form as well. Um, and uh, I am always available too, if you wanna um, contact me directly with any questions. This was, I know, like a super fast overview of how to find things on our website. And now I'm gonna pass it on to um, Carrie and Steph. Thank well, you. yes, good <laughs> afternoon. That was really, we have all sorts of ideas now, Heather. <laughs> Thank you. We also thought it was really funny that 80s to 90s is considered historical. Yeah, we, so we're, we're still saying. in denial of that. But <laughs> yeah, me too. And <laughs> um, we're going to talk about how we've used the collections to tell a story. Steph and I are in the process. We wish we had a finished film to show you now, mm -hmm. but we're in the trenches now working on a documentary film about Helen Stevens, um, who I think we're both a little embarrassed that we didn't know who she was. Yeah, absolutely. Um, until we met an amazing writer who focuses on women's history, Sharon Kenny Hansen, who wrote a book. I'm gonna show you here. I think you can get it in your uh, gift shop, but it's The Fulton Flash, The Life of Helen Stevens, The Fulton Flash. And so Sharon came to our offices because she was really, she's one of those people who is set on getting people's place in history. And I think that's remarkable. And Sharon met Helen and did many years of interviews with Helen. We have those audio tapes, befriended Helen and then made sure those um, artifacts and that Helen saved everything ended up in the collection. So we first got introduced to it in Sharon's basement. And then I spent some time also at the Historical Society. I'm so grateful to Heather and everybody else who helped me access so much. And I only mention that because I think there's a lot of remarkable people in history, but their stories don't get told if we don't save things and have some way to tell their stories. So I really am so grateful for this amazing asset in our community. Um, and so we're embarrassed that we didn't know about Helen Stevens. I'm showing this picture because hopefully you can see it because she is remarkable and it's, I mean, we live in Missouri right. and I teach women's film history, Steph teaches LGBTQ, but it's a really good example of how we can still have gaps in our knowledge. Um, so I'm gonna actually show you some pictures and just talk about Helen Stevens. So those of you who don't know her, know her now if you didn't or know more about her and just what we find interesting about her life right now and then maybe open it up for questions. Hi, Sharon, I saw that you're one of the participants. So Sharon knows much, much more yes. about Helen Stevens. She's our producer with on this film and advisor. So hopefully she can correct any <laughs> or answer any of the chumpies. Okay. Yes, please. Um, so I'm gonna screen share as well. Um, and just show you um, mostly still images because I know that it's hard to, um, to see um, some of the letters and all of the many artifacts we have. But this is Helen Stevens at the 1936 Berlin Olympics. She is mostly known as being the fastest woman in the world mm -hmm. for many decades. Um, and she is a Missouri farm girl from Fulton. Mm -hmm. And she worked really hard to get from there to this point at the young age of 18, um, wowing the entire world with her skills. So I have these two first pictures to start off with because I love this smile you see here. Um, Helen Stevens was really, really funny and witty. Um, but she also, to me, um, when I think of Helen Stevens, and this is maybe a more secret side of her, and that's another reason I want to plug the collections, because it really gives you a much deeper picture mm -hmm. of not just the public persona, but the private person as well. And she was a very smart woman at a time that women didn't have a lot of opportunities mm -hmm. to be smart women and really use those skills later in their life. Um, so. This is Helen Stevens as a young girl, nine years old with her brother, Robert. Um, we actually don't have a lot of pictures from this early time in her life mm -hmm. because um, she grew up poor on a farm and you know, in the 1910s and 20s, not everybody had a camera like today. So, um, so these are really valuable to us. And um, she, this is a high school photo of hers. Um, she really worked hard to get from the farm to school. It wasn't easy. She went to a um, small town, uh, country school and ran her way there and did farm tours and that's how she became so fit. Um, but then in high school, she had to really fight to go to high school and her mother really fought to make sure she had that opportunity and actually had to live in the town of Fulton and go home on the weekends to do chores. So um, class always sort of played a role in Helen's life. She had a much ch more challenging time because her family was um, really struggling on the farm like many people those days. Um, this is her in her high school sort of newspaper that she wrote for. She's a really good writer and English student, and it also promotes this track meet. Um, and really, Helen's life changed when she met this handsome fella, 
Uh, those are my fingers there. <laughs> um, he's Coach Bert Moore. And he was a high school coach and teacher at Fulton High School. And there were no athletics for women back then, but he saw her playing basketball and noticed how fast she was. Helen really wanted to get a letter, but women couldn't get them. And so he decided to clock her. And the very first time he timed her um, on her race, she matched the record for the sprint in 50 year, yard um, dash at 5.8 seconds. The record was by Betty Robinson. So he knew wow, this isn't just a fast young woman. Um, so that really opened up opportunities. He worked really hard to um, make sure he could coach her. Mm -hmm. um, the superintendent of the school didn't want him to coach her. She was a woman, why waste the time? You know, other parents did, but he did anyway, and even took her to her first official meet where she then um, beat the fastest woman in the world, who, who was also called Stella Walsh, I'll introduce her later. So clearly she had talent and they couldn't deny it. And then she went to William Woods to pursue that and also keep getting coached by Coach Moore. So here is Coach Moore coaching her and you see the determination on her face. And I think a lot of that comes from, Helen um, gave a lot of speeches mm -hmm. and those are also in the collection. And she talks about how like from the very moment she was born, she felt like discrimination affected her by not being the woman that everybody expected her to be. She was a tomboy. Um, she didn't fit in with that persona, but she also wasn't the boy that her dad wanted. And so she just worked really hard to be what she thought she should be. Um, and here she is running track with WWC, the uh, William Woods College. And here she is. And one reason I love this picture is um, she notes that people always love you when you're a winner. And mm -hmm. Helen knows both experiences. She knows what it's like to feel like a winner after working really hard, but she also knows what it's like to live the life she wants to live and people then um, maybe turn their backs on her. So I see that determination in her face and I think, oh yeah, that's Helen. She's gonna be who she wants to be. Um, here we've got her also in some publicity photos running track, but all of that leads us to the Olympics, which is really incredibly hard for any person to go to the Olympics, of course, but it's certainly in the 1930s, they did not want women in track. Um, that was not a place for women. And so there's a lot of accounts where the head of the Olympics, you know, really is quoted as saying that they become manly, possibly even lesbians if they run track. So there was very little support for that. Then once they um, did qualify for the Olympics, of course, there was the idea that maybe they didn't have enough money to spend, send the women. So I'm saying this because I feel like, wow, this is quite a long time ago, almost 100 years ago. <laughs> and yet it sounds very familiar. Maybe we don't have the funds for this, um, right? Mm -hmm. So who you see here is Eleanor Roosevelt, actually was a huge advocate in raising the money. And this was her um, Olympic coach, Dee Beckman, also from St. Louis, who really worked so hard along with Helen and along with her hometown to send her to the Olympics, despite the fact that she had no money and she was a woman. So when she was there, she really performed as well as people thought she would. She won the 100 meter dash and set a record that lasted for over 20 years. Um, and she also was one of the people who participated on the 400 meter relay and also won that. So she came home with gold medals. And, you know, I can't get into all the details, but it also was not any ordinary Olympics. It was an incredibly mm -hmm. politically charged Olympic time um, because it's in Berlin in 1936. So uh, there were lots of discussions that we should boycott the Olympics, we shouldn't go, then they decided to go. And even still, it was just a challenging time. If you see there are two African-American women on this team, as well as Jewish women and men. And so it was really quite a complicated time to go to Berlin under Hitler and perform. And this is a picture of Helen in her tracksuit. And the one thing I'd like to say is that Helen was very smart and her favorite subject was modern history. So she was very aware of the politics going on even though she was 18 years old. She had read an abbreviated version of Mein Kampf um, and was um, went to Berlin with eyes wide open as she was there. Here is um, Stella Walsh, her main competitor, actually her very first official race. This is who she um, ran against, who is the Olympic champion and she beat. And so they had a lifelong rivalry that's equally fascinating. Um, here, there's a picture of them shaking, which was a big deal because it was hard to even get them together. Um, after she beat her in St. Louis, the newspapers started a little war, you know, to put them in competition. But Stella wisely didn't run against Helen, knowing that she probably beat her. <laughs> so they didn't really meet against until the Olympics. Um, 
and and here's some of her colleagues and friends that she became really close with lifelong friends and those letters are in the collection that really add the connection that these people had here you have Helen Stevens with Jesse Owens, who is much more well known, um, the fastest man at that time, and also an African American man who took gold um, medals in front of Hitler and everyone right before World War II. And they became friends as well and had a lot in common. And they, um, they came home as heroes. You know, uh, Mayor LaGuardia from New York gave them medals, people gave them parades. They both, it's hard to describe, but track was the sport back then. It wasn't basketball or even soccer, um, it was track. And so they became um, stars for a brief time because uh, Helen's a woman and she doesn't fit into that identity of a typical woman at that time. And Jesse Owens is obviously an African-American man. So when they came home, it was a challenging homecoming mm -hmm. um, because their opportunities were limited in a prejudiced uh, America. Helen is probably, if you Google Helen Stevens, I think one of the first things that comes up is the fact that she met Hitler. He would um, pull aside some of the winners and talk to them one-on-one. -on -one. And uh, famously, Hitler um, was very- Handsy. Handsy, that's a good <laughs> word, Seth. Um, and she sort of put him in his place, which was didn't happen a lot with Hitler. And it was also, she thought, ironic. He thought she was the perfect Aryan woman that she should maybe race for Germany. And she thought, wow, I have Cherokee blood in me. You know, what, what this fool, what does he know? Um, but this is probably possibly what's most famous is the fact that he got fresh with her. But really there's so much more to Helen, which is why we're so appreciative to share and writing the book and giving that much more um, a deeper life. This is Helen. Um, I like this photo because it really captures her spirit. You know, she had a heck of a time after she won the Olympics and traveled around Europe and Germany. Um, and here she is with the Bavarian band leading the way. Um, and she's meeting uh, presidents and, and she meets uh, mayors and she meets Hoover, who immediately starts a file on her. Uh, so she has a notorious life. Um, here's a letter from one of her colleagues that also the fastest woman before Helen, Betty Robinson. And these letters really show that time period and the closeness. I'll just read a little bit of it. This is right after they get home. H how are you anyway? I've been thinking about you so much and we just like keep keep putting off writing. Before I go any further, let me tell you that I still have your girdle. I feel very ashamed that I did not think to return it before you left for Washington. How about you letting me buy it from you? So here are the two fastest women in the woman in the world writing each other about buying the girdle from the other person. And to me, that's how um, a collection brings a life to a person. Here's the Look magazine. And then her life really changed. It changed a little bit in um, Germany. She also, one of the things that she's well known for is the first person to be gender tested at the Olympics, mm -hmm. which is still an ongoing debate today. Um, who should be running and how do we test them um, and why we're doing it. Um, and so she had a medical exam was proven to be a woman, but those rumors really followed her whole life. It actually kind of started with her rival Stella Walsh ran for Poland because she was a Polish immigrant in America and they kind of started that rumor, but it followed her home. Yeah. Do you want to talk about look or? <laughs> I'll just say no, Steph no. is working on another film simultaneously. <laughs> so she's like deep into that. Um, but here is a magazine. It's kind of like Time or Life. It's a it's a sort of um, everyday American magazine that was very popular at the time. And it's also sensational if you look at some of the things. Uh, Joan Crawford, her past from waitress to star, you know. And inside Look magazine, right after she gets home, is this article: When is a woman actually a woman? Today's chief worry about worry among athletic officials. And it's very sensational. They show um, a woman who's become a man. And then on the next page, you see Hel Helen Stevens. Is this a man or a woman? And at the bottom, it literally says, study the above picture closely and um, see whether you can tell if it's a man or a woman. And then they say, ah, she's a woman. Um, but these kinds of rumors followed her throughout her life and really um, changed the opportunities that she could have possibly had if she was a different kind of woman or looked a different way. And if you, here's what's interesting about seeing the original. If you actually see on the back and look up close, it says, don't let anyone see this clipping and don't show any, don't let anyone see this but yourself. Um, so it was, of course, today's social media, that would be impossible. But mm -hmm. then the worry that everybody would see this and continue these rumors um, was really challenging. 
The other part of her life that is you know, more secretive, more private um, are, are, is Helen's personal life. She was a lesbian and had many love relationships that are well, well documented in this collection. And it's truly fascinating. I think this is where I fell down the rabbit hole deeply because there are so many love letters from her younger days and they, they capture young love. So it's so authentic. I don't know how else to put it, but it's so authentic and real. But it also gives you a snapshot of what it must have been like to be gay in the 1930s um, and try to have a life. So this is just one example from her longtime um, uh, girlfriend, Kay. Um, but there's so many letters from Kay and Helen. And, and Heather actually has an amazing article you should all read about just this specific um, her relationships and her letters, because it is one sided. You have Kay writing to Helen, but of course, you don't have Helen's le letters to Kay. And Helen, after the Olympics, is having a, a great time traveling around, starting this new life, and Kay's at home. Um, and what I especially gleaned from reading all these letters was you know, there are very few opportunities for women at this time. Um, you got married and had kids, or what? And Helen didn't want to get married and have kids, but most of the people she fell in love with did. And so you see in these letters, this evolution of like the reality and can they live like Helen, which is a really hard way to live, to be so honest about your life. But if you even read this, it says, good morning, my sweet. Did you know I always connect that word with you? It's about 1030 and I've been listening to the broadcast of Wallace's and Edward's wedding. Dear, they have gone through humiliation after humiliation and still they love each other and are married. We can do it and we will if we really love each other enough, which I think we do. And it goes on and on, but you just feel honestly the pain of heartache um, and these relationships. And when you read enough of them, you realize how hard it must have been for Helen and her girlfriends to go through this. Um, at the same time, we have artifacts that show uh, Helen's post-Olympic life. Um, so, you know, if you were a man and you were white, you'd probably go into the movies, you'd be Tarzan or something, but Jesse Owens didn't have that opportunity. If you were um, a petite looking uh, feminine woman, you'd go into the movies and swim or something, but that wasn't Helen. So instead they raced each other during exhibition races at baseball games and different events. And this is a good example of, a, of a, a, just a telegram. Here's hoping you beat Owens and set a record. Good luck, the gang in 42. So she would race Jesse Owens um, at baseball games and things like that. And by the way, she nearly would beat him. She would get very close to that. Um, but I think it, it shows a lot of Jesse and Helen's life and opportunities after the Olympics. Um, here she is actually, then the war interrupts a lot of her early years and she's actually um, enlisted into being in the Marine Reserves. She was very committed to, to going to support her country. Um, and here's an example of some of the promotional um, posters they have for Helen to race against J Jesse Owens or any man in a match race. But what Helen ended up doing is that, you know, she had she couldn't be an Olympic athlete because she didn't have the money to be amateur. She had to make money. And so she became a basketball player. Um, she, for a year, she um, was on a team. And then of course, in true Helen fashion, she's like, well, I could start my own team and manage it better. <laughs> so she started her own basketball team. The Helen um, Stevens Olympic co-eds was the first woman to have her own ba basketball team, manage the team and traveled all over the nation for many years. Um, and the whole gist of it was that they would play men's teams by men's rules. So they would, they would take on a man's team in different places all over the country. Here's a publicity photo. Um, and here's the crew. Uh, I always think this is kind of like a league of their own meets Orange is the New Black, if you could read some of the stories and letters from this time period. But what it really showed were a lot of these women, when they weren't traveling and playing basketball, they really had to fit into pretty strict stereotypes. Uh, you know, some of them were married, some of them not happily. Um, but on the road, they could kind of be who they wanted to be, and they did. So here's another example of, of one of those um, posters. But really, Helen, like I mentioned, was very smart and wanted a career. And she ended up having a many decades lifelong career at the, I'm going to actually read it because I always get this wrong. It's a defense mapping. Thank you. Defense Mapping Agency Aerospace Center in St. Louis. She was a librarian. 
and did that for many, many years. She had top secret security and she met the love of her life there, Mabel Roby. She had a lot of relationships, like I mentioned, that were documented in the collection, but she actually settled down with Mabel um, and they lived together for other, over 40 years until they died. She also went back to her alma mater, William Woods and coached track there. And I found this fascinating because after Helen came back and her gender identity was questioned and also, you know, Helen was maybe wearing pants a lot and she got caught in the room with other girls. Um, basically, uh, the head of William Woods tried to kick her out by taking her scholarships away. And this is right after she won the Olympics. Um, and her mom insisted that she finish her education no matter what. So she moved off campus, took, took extra jobs and finished her her degree. She really knew that her degree would open doors. And Helen um, really is actually very, very passionate and supported her college and alma mater and then went on to coach track there. And there's a lot of documentation of that because Helen was really committed to lifelong sports. Here's a letter from Coach Moore, just an example. Um, but he also had to discuss how to um, present her an award ceremony when she started to win medals and honors and how hard that was because there's so much to say. Um, here is uh, Helen with Coach Moore. She was an incredibly loyal, lifelong friend, if you were her friend. Um, and uh, she actually went on to speak on the speaker circuit, which is where she met Sharon Kenny Hansen, um, who wrote her book. And uh, she, if you know the Show Me State Games, she carried the torch the very first nine years they did it, was really active in Senior Olympics. She really was committed to being a lifelong athlete and found ways to do that. And um, also would advocate for other athletes to have their place, um, either in halls of fame or simply supporting athletics for everybody. And even was instrumental in getting title passed. So they've named the Helen Stevens Sports Complex at William Woods. You can go there today and see some of her artifacts there. This is one of the few pictures we have of Mabel, but this is also Helen with her 400 meter relay um, crew on a reunion. So some of her later years. But I think um, what's fascinating in honor of Pride Month, I'd like to talk briefly about this relationship she had with Stella Walsh, who was her lifelong rival. And they had a lot in common in that they were both poor American athletes at a time when women didn't participate that way. But they also had rather private secret lives because of the time period they lived in. Um, here's a much later letter where um, she's talking about how she's working really hard to get into the Hall of Fame and she's trying to support Stella to get into the Hall of Fame. So I, I find that fascinating that Helen Stevens had to insist on her place in history and advocate for herself to be just you know, honestly honored for the things she's already done. But once she did that, she worked really, really hard to get other people the place they deserved. So her and Stella, um, they stayed in touch. And this is remarkable because Stella um, was a fierce rival and Stella also had a complicated life. Um, even though Stella was in some ways part of the reason the rumors started about Helen's gender and um, her life, um, they kind of understood each other. And when uh, actually in 1980, Stella Walsh had a really unfortunate death in a burglary gone awry and she was murdered. And then they realized um, because of an autopsy that Stella Walsh, her major rival was intersex. And at that time, they didn't really know what to think of um, somebody who wasn't a man and wasn't a woman, but was intersex and that it could be more complicated than that. And so they immediately went to Helen Stevens for some comment on this. And Helen really advocated that she keep her gold medals, that they tried to stay away, to try to take away and really said that that was dastardly, that they would even consider doing that. So you have to understand 1980, it was very sensational the way they hyped this up again. Um, and Helen understood what was going on and again advocated. And actually, this is one of my favorite pictures because this is Stella and this is Helen, you know, and they're just like make, you know, play acting like it's a race again. Um, so they had a lifelong relationship. I'm going to end with one letter that I find personally fascinating. What I found through studying the artifacts and, and stuff and I talk about a lot is how Helen had to work so hard to be her authentic self at a time that really didn't accept that. And at a certain point, she sort of stopped. And you notice these letters, they're, they're talking about Mabel and you know, you and Mabel are gonna come to the Washington DC together. And, and they're really, everybody knows that um, she's in this relationship. She's as open as you probably can be at that time. Um, and she's really honest about who she is. So here's uh, somebody contacting her to do an interview as they would do around the Olympics. And she writes back and it's remarkable, Helen knew her place in history because she would keep carbon copies of some of her letters knowing that we would like to see them. Um, but it says your letter was received and pleased you would like to do this type of interview with me, but as doubtful it would be worth your while 
Um, and then she explains, perhaps I am cynical based on past experiences, but I do not feel qualified to perso personify the petite, sexy type of female usually desired for publicity purposes. I'm six foot tall, weigh 190 pounds, not fat, and possess a husky voice. I'm employed as a librarian at the Aeronautical Chart and Information Center um, in St. Louis in the Technical Library. At, I'm president of a bowling league in Ferguson and bowl once a week, had 167 average last year. Um, lead a simple life, share a home with a friend, raise a few roses, have a pet cat, photography a hobby, like to fish. And then basically at the end, she's like, if you still want to interview me, <laughs> because Helen was constantly contacted for interviews, and I think she wasn't what they expected her to be. And at a certain point, she let people know in her own way, this is who I am if you still want to come to me. So I'm going to leave it there. Mm -hmm. Steph, do you want to add? I feel like obviously I did all the talking. But... <laughs> no, I mean, I think what you said was great. I mean, she just was um, definitely so many admirable. I mean, even even today when I when I look back and sometimes I wish I had uh, the kind of courage that she had mm -hmm. and um, and she did. She truly lived uh, an, an authentic life. And that's definitely something to be admirable for the time period. So I think it was beautiful. Yeah. Thank you. So now Steph will answer any of your questions. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I thank you, everyone, so much uh, for a great conversation today. And we do have some questions coming in for you. Um, first up is, uh, is from Rodney, who says, thank you for this entire presentation. Helen Stevens' story is moving and fascinating and looking forward to the film. And then the question is, uh, when might it be completed? Oh, that's, uh, that's always a great question. Um, <clears throat> you know, the truth is, 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 um, you know, Carrie and I've been working on this for quite a number of years, actually, and and it's gone on and it's taken a lot of iterations. And the fact that we've we've wanted to do a short documentary, we wanted to do a feature documentary. We actually wrote a short film, a short narrative um, as well, um, and I think it's you know in something like twenty five pages. And we're hoping maybe someday to get that produced as well. Um, but now we're kind of back to this idea, and and Carrie's actually doing dri uh, driving this mostly of, of really trying to get a, a, a short doc. And I don't know, I mean, perhaps uh, uh, maybe a rough cut by the end of summer is, mm -hmm. is something that we're talking about and, and really hoping that maybe we can, um, you know, just get something out there. I mean, this woman is just such a powerhouse and just so amazing and her story needs to continually to be told. And so um, I know that we're both really, really passionate about this and, and um, so yeah, stay, stay tuned. <laughs> Right. If we do our jobs, you'll see it by the end of the year. Uh, one question that's uh, related to that, at the beginning of your, your talk, you said that, um, you know, despite your, uh, you know, your focus in, in your work, that at first you, you really didn't know about Helen, about Helen. So um, how, how did you find out about Helen Stevens? Uh, that's a great question. I actually, um, uh, Sharon um, found me and um, she came up to the school and um, <clears throat> and she even walked with me to a class. I, I was like uh, on my way to teaching a class and she said, can I just have two minutes of your time? And I said, absolutely. You know, we, she introduced herself to me and she gave me her book and she said, um, I, I think this woman is incredibly important um, and, and you're a filmmaker and I would love to get together with you and, and talk about this story. And, and I, I was honored that she had even thought of me and I was honored that she was giving me her book. And I said, okay, great, let me, let me look at this. I, you know, I hated to let her go, but I had to get into class. I said, I'll be in touch. And I don't know, a few days later or a week later, whatever, um, we called and we talked and we started this process. And then Carrie and I have been, um, you know, such great colleagues for a number of years. I was like, I can't think of anybody that I wouldn't, I, I mean, she was the one I wanted to work on this project with. We have been looking for a project together um, that we could both, you know, be a part of. And, and Carrie was like, yeah, this is it. This is perfect. This is something that, again, we both feel incredibly passionate about. So, um, so really it was Sharon. I mean, again, Sharon mm -hmm. just is, uh, she spearheaded this. She's the one that got us going and, and introduced it. And, and yeah. 
Interesting. Uh, well, another question for the two of you. Um, Carrie, the other day you spoke a little bit about being a detective when you explore the collections. So as you were doing that, what were some things that maybe um, surprised you or what was some of the you know, detection work you had to undertake to research for the film? I think um, you're right, like being a, a documentary filmmaker, it is like being a detective and you can get really deep into the rabbit hole because you. I feel like I know Helen a little bit because I spend every day with her and yet we never met. But I would say um, certain things, I think her honesty in her letters that I mentioned, but for instance, there is a letter that she wrote to a doctor in Hannibal, and even another letter that her coach D Beckman talks about trying to put her in touch with a doctor to consider a sex change operation in 1937. Um, and the letter from the doctor, you know, says we can do this, but um, I want you to know, you know, your life is going to be challenging and, and uh, you know, discusses the challenges of that. And then if you piece that together with her love letters, you realize part of it is that, you know, she wants to maybe pass as a man so that she can truly marry the love of her life and how painful is that. And within that same letter, um, I learned how accepting her mom was because her girlfriend Kay talks in a letter saying, I wish my mom was like your mom. She doesn't, you know, she doesn't believe in me and she doesn't accept who I am. And you start to understand how remarkable it is that, that um, Helen Stevens' mother was her advocate all her life really and understood who she truly was. She made sure she got an education even though her father thought she should go to the shoe factory. She made sure when they tried to kick her out of her school that she'd finished that education and she accepted her for, for who she was. Um, another question um, about Helen, uh, I'm curious if you encountered this in your research, did Helen later reflect on the 1936 Olympics and what it felt like to be there just prior to the world falling apart as Nazism was fully unleashed on the world. And did she ever wonder if the US should have boycotted those Olympics? Yes, if, and that's again, kind of like detective work if you read it all throughout the years. Um, one thing that she did, a, a, a teacher, I believe, gave her a diary and said, you know, this is a really important event, you should keep a diary, and Helen did. She kept a coded diary that then Sharon did a really good job of uncoding, and so much of that is in the book, and also you can read the diary in the collections. Um, so she really noted um, all of that. And there's actually a really great film I'll plug. We didn't make it. Um, Olympic Pride American Prejudice that talks specifically about the African Americans during that specific year. But there were so many politics of being there. Hitler was trying to show off this nation he's building. And yet clearly, honestly, the Germans are falling in love with all these athletes, inc including the African-American athletes. So it's quite a conundrum and she's writing about that. She's also writing about the politics. Um, some of the Jewish players were replaced by African-American players. Some of the African-American players were replaced by white players. And this is by the, um, by the Olympic committees, but also the coaches. And so um, I'm not an expert on that, but you start, she understands the challenges and the politics of all of that very well. But it's interesting, they even tried to, um, they actively contacted Helen Stevens and other female athletes to boycott the Olympics on behalf of, of the Jewish treatment of people and what we did know then. Um, and so she discussed that and, and really felt like that wouldn't do any good. Um, but also the way they appealed to Helen and the female athletes, the idea was that they were women, they were more emotional. If they did it, then others would follow. Um, but Helen and other athletes felt like this was also their chance to make a change. That's kind of the way I would summarize it. But it's interesting because if you read her letters later, there was another consideration of boycotting the Olympics in the Soviet Union during the Cold War and her mind's kind of changed a little bit there. So I think maybe, you know, when you're young and you've been training for it, your perspective might be different than when you're older. That's the way I would take that. But yeah, there, it's that's very, very well researched. Just all of that, the politics of all of that. Uh, Heather, I, ha I have a question for you. So if someone is, you mentioned that a lot of this collection is not available digitally. Um, so if someone is wanting to come in to delve into these collections, whether that's for a, you know, a project or a class, um, like about how, like how much in advance do you recommend that people book those visits to come in? Um, it really depends on what you want to look at. Um, I would say for manuscript collections, um, you know, if, if you think it's a collection from another 
research center, you know, and you're going to have to have a ship from St. Louis to in a Rala or something, um, I would say one to two weeks, um, at least. We can usually accommodate appointments, um, you know, if say you're coming to Columbia and it's a Columbia collection, we can usually accommodate those um, just a day or two in advance. Um, and, and for microfilm uh, here at Columbia, you know, we could even take same day appointments because the microfilm is, is all on site. So it really depends on the materials you're looking at, where you want to go, um, where you want to, um, yeah, where you're going to, where you're going to go to look at it. Okay. Uh, another question is how did we get Helen Stevens materials donated to the State Historical Society? Yeah, so actually, um, Sharon Kenny Hansen, again, like big promoter of Helen and her life. Um, Sharon um, had all of Helen's um, materials and used that to write uh, the biography. And she was a big advocate for making sure those materials made it here um, for, for preservation. Um, and so, so the, the Helen Stevens collection, um, and I should mention, the Helen Stevens collection that's like called the Helen Stevens collection here that came from Sharon and it is all materials that Helen created, you know, her letters, that sort of thing. We also have the William Woods University collection um, and there are there are quite a few Helen Stevens related materials in there. So this is actually an example and this happens quite a lot with archival collections where you know, it, the materials related to what someone might be researching could be in several different collections. Um, and just to complicate things further, we also have the Sharon Kinney Hansen collection, which has some of her research um, that she did <laughs> while writing the book. So, um, so yeah, it's the, um, but the Helen Stevens collection, Sharon was the one who made sure that that came here. Okay, great. A uh, note just came in from Dr. Sarah Jones from the Missouri State Museum in Jefferson City, who um, agrees that Helen is a fascinating topic and so that uh, she was featured in the Missouri Trailblazers exhibition that they did. So all sorts of exciting things going on there. Uh, next sort of a uh, comment question combo. This is that the Mary Jane Burnett collection is wonderful and um, was used to prompt some memories to write a piece that was published. And uh, Sharon says here she grew up in Cape and lived next to Jane and Tommy. And the question piece is when and how did Jane go about um, donating the collection? You know, that I'm not sure. Um, that is a Cape Girardeau collection. So it was donated to our Cape Girardeau Research Center. And I actually don't know um, the history of how it was donated, um, but I've read your article and loved it. Um, that's, it's so fascinating to me. I, yeah, I love Jane and Tommy. <laughs> I love that collection. Uh, another question for you, Heather, about the collections. Uh, you know, as you showed us today, there is so much great content, some digitized, a lot not. Um, do you have some advice for people researching the collections? Like, have there been some common pitfalls that researchers have run into? Or perhaps even Carrie and Steph, you could speak to some things where your first search didn't get you what you wanted and you had to kind of revisit how you were searching uh, just to provide some, some tips and tricks for others who might be wanting to use these collections. Uh, well, the first thing I have to say is allow more, allow for more time than you think you need. That's the main, you know, I, that example of the promo records, 12 big old boxes of stuff. Um, I can't even remember how many pieces of paper can fit in a box, you know, but it's over a thousand. So don't think you're going to look at every item in a collection. You really need to use those finding aids, navigate, and then just allow yourself a ton of time. Um, yeah, and you can't do it last minute. Like I said, you got to make that appointment and kind of plan ahead. So allow for a lot of time, plan ahead, use the finding aids, and talk to the archivist. That's the other piece is we can help you, you know, especially if it's your first time doing research in archival materials. Um, just talk to, if you're on site, talk to whoever's at the desk, email us, call us, any questions you have, you don't have to do it alone. That's, that's my advice. <laughs> 
Great. Well, it looks like we are getting right up on that hour mark. So I'm going to go ahead and turn things back over to Stephen to sort of um, conclude our conversation today. But it has been my privilege to get to be on with all you amazing panelists. And I can't wait to explore the collection more. And I, like um, many others on this webinar today, will be uh, waiting for the film very excitedly. Well, wow. Wow. Um, I'm just overwhelmed by um, what we've learned today and I'm so excited um, to hear about um, the research um, underway with Helen. Um, looking at the participants today, we have such a great group of people joining us. We have a lot of historians and, and researchers across the state, um, colleagues from St. Louis at Washington University Missouri History Museum. Um, our fellow trustee Brett Schondelmeyer is joining us today. So a great group. Um, I think this is a great, um, a vibrant first um, start at doing um, presentations regarding the LGBTQI experience Missouri through the society. Uh, we're brainstorming future ideas, uh, maybe some ideas for the fall. So if some folks have um, topics or story ideas for the fall, possibly um, you can feel free to reach out to probably the society or find me um, in St. Louis at the St. Louis LGBTQ um, website. Um, if you have some thoughts and some future um, panel discussions. We'd be happy to hear your ideas about those. So um, I just want to wrap up today and say thank you for um, to everyone who um, has joined us and to the great panel today. Um, I, I will echo um, a lot of us on the call and the participants. Um, yeah, it's a rabbit hole. You get into these collections and you just, you know, I do it. Uh, if I get into newspapers.com, I'm there for hours. Um, one of my colleagues, Ian Darnell, we both can spend hours at, at newspapers.com and, and never come up for air. So um, it's a great um, time to be doing research um, and Missouri has all these great resources. So um, let's use them and let's make sure that we're preserving and promoting our history. And um, we've got the, a lot of tools at our disposal to do that. So again, um, thank you all for joining us and we look forward to future programming. Mm -hmm.